when you tell a story and you actually see members of the audience, as you do when you've told a story well with tears in their eyes. That's what you should get with a good story. Hello, intelligent beings of this marvelous planet. Welcome to Learn From The Brands, our podcast made with love for you from 42courses.com. Today, you'll hear about how to get over the fear of public speaking, how to write a book, and how to write incredible speeches. Simon Lancaster is one of the world's top speechwriters. He first became a speechwriter in the 1990s, working with members of Tony Blair's cabinet. Today, he writes speeches for the CEOs of some of the biggest companies in the world. Simon is a TEDx speaker, his most popular speech on YouTube having been seen over three and a half million times. He is a visiting lecturer at Cambridge University. He regularly appears on BBC and Sky News and writes guest columns for The Guardian and Total Politics. He's the author of three best-selling books, Speechwriting, The Expert Guide, Winning Minds, Secrets from the Language of Leadership, and You Are Not Human, How Words Kill, all highly recommended. I'm really excited to speak to him because I've been a longtime fan. So welcome, Simon Lancaster. It's great to be here with you, Brent. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Wonderful, wonderful. Really great to have you here. So, Simon, for people that uh, are not aware of you, can you explain, like, what do you get up to for your clients right now? What do I get up to for my clients? So um, I'm a speech writer. So that's one of these classic jobs where you do do what it says on the tin, actually. I write speeches for them. People have a funny idea about speech writers and what we do. There's this wonderful image of us, which is perpetuated in programmes like Yes Minister in the West Wing of these sinister people operating like puppeteers in the background. It's not really like that at all. You know, the basic rule of speech writing is when it goes well, it's all because of the client because they're wonderful. I mean, when it goes badly, it's definitely all my fault. Um, so what I do, I work with them and um, use um, my knowledge, experience um, to help them give the very best speech that they can give. And so, you know, sometimes using techniques that I've pulled from ancient rhetoric or communications um, theory, um, and sometimes just helping them with jokes or uh, stories, but really working very much one-to-one -to, -one to help them be the best they can be. Um, and that's different for everyone that I work with. You know, sometimes um, so, so some of my clients are, are boring, you know, and they would concede that they're boring. And so for them, I just help them give the least boring speech that they can possibly <laughs> give. And just maybe, you know, if, they, if they're dead boring, just give them a, a little germ of a story or, or a joke or a metaphor or something at the beginning of the speech, just enough to hook the audience in and then touch back to it at the end. And that can make it far less of a murderous experience for the audience. That's interesting, isn't it? If someone is uh, not the most charismatic person, uh, you can't write an Obama-esque type speech for them, can you? Because it's like, it doesn't fit their, you know, everyday uh, personality that the people already, the audience will already know. So you have to fit their speaker. Absolutely. You'd make an idiot of them. I mean, and you do see it sometimes. You do see... Um, sometimes people giving speeches that they're so clearly uncomfortable with. Sometimes it's just a little manifestation in their body language. You can see it's not their words or they're, they're you know, reading out a joke and they don't know how to land the punchline. It doesn't come naturally to them. And that ruins the whole, whole thing. The whole thing about a speech is about forming a connection between the speaker and the audience. And to do that, the speaker needs to be being open. If they look like they're being phony, they're putting on an act. So growing up as a little boy in England, you know, people have like, oh, I want to be a, a policeman or a teacher. It's, speech right is not one of those things that really is in the, in the consideration set, is it? So how did you become a speech writer? What was the journey? The, the journey for me started when I was 11 years old, actually. And I, I remember being taught by my music teacher, Bernie Newman at school, and he taught me the basic one, four, five chords. 
And from that moment on, I actually wanted to be a songwriter. I desperately wanted to be a songwriter. All the time when I was at school, I was writing songs. And then when I left school, my very first job was playing piano in a restaurant just off Leicester Square, a French restaurant called Chez Solange. You know, playing in a restaurant, I'll, I'll slip in some of my own tunes in the evening and they're gonna discover me, give me a huge publishing contract or whatever. As it was, <laughs> that, that didn't happen, funnily enough. Um, and the restaurant ended up closing down. So I then needed to get a proper job, basically. And so in the, I'm fast forward in a few years, I wound up in the civil service and I then became a private secretary working for Alan Johnson when he was Dream Minister. He was a guy I admired hugely. I still admire him hugely. He was someone who, um, who, who changed my perspective completely on leadership and communication because he had left school when he was 15 he was orphaned his first job was stacking shelves in Tesco he then became a postman and yet he rose to become a leader he became leader first of the communication workers union and then he got very close to becoming leader of the Labour Party he could have done it I, I swear if he'd have wanted it he didn't have the ruthless ambition um, and so then it was working for him and I watched him giving speeches he had humour empathy, stories, wonderful gift for sound bites. And I, at the time I was in my mid twenties and I just watched him with awe. And I, I thought this is amazing. And he was really, he was a failed songwriter as well. And so we used to talk about this a lot. And then I worked for him as his private secretary for about two years. My next job after that was a full-time speech writer when I was, I don't know, maybe 28 or something. Um, and I've I've not looked back. It's been my it's been my only job ever since. I couldn't do anything else now. I couldn't do a real job. <laughs> but um, you, you spoke about the uh, rhetoric just a moment ago, and uh, so you, you you jumped from job to job. But you must have done some self learning. And and in, in all the books, actually, you, you speak about you know Aristotle, Cicero, and the Greeks and everything. So how did you pick that information up? Yeah, so I, I like Alan Johnson, and like I guess you know the the um, the the great guy we were talking about earlier, but uh, behind forty two courses, you know, all of us had disastrous experiences of education, actually, of formal education. So I ducked out of the education system when I was sixteen years old. When I say I ducked out, I, I was kicked out of school. I had a big boot up my ass. I was expelled when I was 16 years old um, from, by, by the teacher um, who actually he'd say, he said I, I was going to fail all of my A-levels. I just needed to get out. I've still got all of the my old school reports as well as letters to my mum saying he's not working hard enough. He's going to fail all of his A-levels. And I was like, I then laboured under this, and in fact, I left, left school. I thought, I swear I can, I can pass these A-levels. So I took them and I did pass them both. I ended up getting a B um, in English and an E in music. <laughs> I got an E in music, so I did it without even having the, the set tapes. Um, and it was only later when I, I became speechwriter at the Department for Education, and I started understanding far more about who succeeds in education who succeeds in the education system and why they succeed. And I grew up in a very poor background. I was brought up by a single mum on benefits in a council flat in London. People like me, we don't go to university. We just don't, <laughs> you know? And so it was really no surprise. And it was, and also as well, when you come from a poor background like that, your teachers constantly underestimate your potential, constantly under. So when they threw me out and said, you're not gonna pass your A-levels, and then I went and passed them, that's actually quite typical. And it was only when I, I then, um, was at the Department for Education when I would have been about 32 maybe. And I thought, sod it, I don't need to live with this anymore. I can change this, I'm in charge of my own life now. And my wife had long been saying to me, you should go to university, you're easily bright enough to go to university. And so I did, I went, I did a master's in mass comms whilst I was working as a speechwriter um, at the Department for Education. Um, I passed it and now I lecture at Cambridge University. And so, you know, my, 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 my message here, there were many, many people who I've met, particularly in business, you know, um, not so much in the professions. In the professions, most people do come from posh homes, but in business in particular, there's a lot of people who had similar experiences to me and Alan Johnson, where the system basically failed you and you did all of your education as an adult. 
And so, you know, one of my, my key messages that I'm always pushing out, and this is what I talked about in my TEDx talk, is you can speak like a leader, <laughs> you know, and don't let anyone tell you that you can't. Don't let anyone put you in a little box and say you're going to fail all your A-levels. If they do, just tell them to rip off. <laughs> <laughs> um it's interesting that you, you speak about socioeconomic, uh, um, the results of socioeconomic status there. And there's one thing that jumps out of me from, um, from Winning Minds, the language of leadership, is you talk about that uh, posh people use short sentences with like 12 words and people from other strata do not. Can you expand on that a bit? Yeah, I mean, it was just, it was something random that popped out of some research I did into senior politicians, the language of senior politicians. It was 2009. And I just took all of the, I think, the top five figures in each of the three main parties, and I analysed their use of rhetorical devices, their use of metaphor, their average length of word, and their average length of sentence. And it was striking that all of your David Camerons and Nick Clegg, George Osborne, all people who went to expensive public schools, Eton, respectively Eton, Westminster College and St Paul's, all of them spoke in very short sentences, 12 word sentences. And all those who came from poorer backgrounds, comprehensives, people like Alan Johnson, Gordon Brown, William Hague, they all spoke in much longer sentences. And I mean, I don't know, this was a matter of fact, it was like the top five speakers all went to public schools in terms of their short sentences. And then at the other end, all of the bottom five in terms of long sentences went to comprehensives. So I can't say for sure why, but my theory is that, you know, there's a little bit of people from poorer homes thinking, I've got to show my vocabulary, I've got to show my knowledge, I've got to show that I can think well, which often requires long sentences, you know, good thought and long sentences do often go together. Whereas for the other guys, those who went to the better schools, I think there's probably more of a motivation for them to speak plainly and to sound like, you know, the average average man or woman on, on the street. So hence, they're just cutting their sentences right down. But a really interesting thing, and of course, when you travel, you know, and you go to uh, countries like, uh, well, India or, or Africa, Southeast Asia, and they're giving speeches in English, there their sentences are, you know, like really long. <laughs> and it gets, so the same kind of theory, you know, would fit with that. But I can't say for sure, but it's just, it's a definite phenomenon that I've noticed mm -hmm. as a speech. And another super interesting uh, uh, excerpt from the book is like that, the, the UK political parties, their use of metaphors are like links to their history and logos, which is just astonishing. If you can tell us about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So that's right. In this same study, what I found was that conservatives are far more likely, I can't remember exactly, I think it might be five times more likely to use nature and personification metaphors than Labour politicians and Labour politicians were much more likely to use war metaphors than Tory politicians. Then, then you had the Lib Dems in the, the middle who were far more journey metaphors. And again, this was just something that came out of the research. I had commissioned this research with no kind of expectations for what would come out of it. Um, and when I saw this, I was like, Oh my goodness. And then, you know, so nature personification, the Tory logo was the tree. Um, Lib Dem's metaphor was the journey and you had the dove, you know, so motion and journey within the dove. And then Labour was, was war. And of course, you know, when the Labour Party were actively mimicking Tory language, they went the red, red, the red flag revolution. But you, this is the kind of thing you have to do as a speechwriter. You need to analyze people's metaphors so that you can write in their styles. So in short, if you're writing for a Labour minister, you'll be talking about the, the NHS is under attack and we've got to fight for our rights and we've got to defend them, you know, from these savage cuts that are being inflicted. That's classic Labour war language, whereas the Tories are more likely to talk about 
the heart of our communities, the DNA of our communities and allowing people to blossom and flourish, you know, far more of that kind of language. Not saying either one is better or worse, but just recognizing this is how my client speaks and therefore that's the style that I've got to write for. And do you think that it would be possible for members of, let's say, just as, as an example, Labour uh, politicians speaking in the metaphors of the Conservative Party in an effort to, to win votes or sound more um, parliamentarian or, or, or more electable? Yeah. That, 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 would you think that would work to change the language that suited their audience or would that, that would just fall flat? Well, I mean, the thing is, is that it's not a, there's not an iron wall between these, the, the language of both parties. Do you know what I mean? On both sides, their tendencies. So the Tories tend to speak more like that, but they will still use war metaphors. You know, Boris during um, COVID has been using war metaphors all over the place constantly. So there are exceptions to that. But to, to, to your precise question, could the the parties actively seek to use other metaphors and achieve change no doubt at all yes they could you know and um i mean that's something where i think they actually are being smarter now they are being smarter and so i think in the last couple of years i'd be quite curious to do the analysis to repeat the study i did now based on what the parties are doing because um a couple of things. I think uh, there is now much more knowledge about metaphor now than there was when I did the study. I did the study in 2009. Since then, there's been so much research on metaphor and it's been far more high profile. So I know that people at number 10 and people at the top of the Labour Party, they know about the power of metaphor. They know about some of these studies. So they will be actively changing the language in particular areas. But I think there are areas like, you know, um, Keir Starmer is very clearly using the liberal Democrat language about journeys at the moment. So he's talking about we're climbing a mountain and, you know, he's saying actively we're on a journey. So it's very much saying we're getting away from socialism, revolution, and we're back to some of that safer centrist language, which is far more reassuring. Now, Boris Johnson's... Um, He's a genius when it comes to metaphor, you know, and I say this as someone, his, his politics are not my politics, but he's, he's a genius when it comes to metaphor. So his use of food metaphors around Brexit was a work of art. So to start off with, you had the whole thing about Brexit. Sounds a bit like breakfast. How many times were you, Brent, in conversations with people when people would inadvertently say breakfast when they meant to say Brexit? You had that suggestion all the way along. Boris straight away was talking about having our cake and eating it. If you, do, do you remember when he did that? Yeah, yeah. And so this then led, and everyone was then talking about cake. Even his opponents were talking about bre cake. Brexit then became cake to the extent that we now actually have in the English dictionary, the words cakeism and cakeist to talk about thinking, you know, you can have everything in a negotiation on Europe. So he made Brexit food. It speaks to our instinctive brain. It says, be hungry, be greed, greedy, you know, come this way, come this way, we're giving you food. And then during the election campaign, we had all of the talk about oven ready deals. And through the whole election campaign, pretty much every day of the election campaign, Boris was pictured with food. He went either to a, a baker's, a patisserie, he went to a crisp factory, he delivered food to people's houses, he was shown putting a pie in an oven, and all the time talking about our oven-ready deal, you know? And so this is really powerful, subliminal communication. If you said to people, and I do say to people, what was Boris's metaphor on, on food? They wouldn't have a have a clue that sorry what was his metaphor on brexit they wouldn't have a clue most of the time they wouldn't even be able to answer the question but as soon as you say you remember the oven ready deal you remember have our cake and eat it these ideas were firmly firmly landed and indeed one of my um one of my gurus professor jonathan chartres black he's um main man on metaphor probably in the whole of europe 
um, and he's at University of West of England. And he did a count of all the articles about Brexit that mentioned cake. <laughs> 1,283 articles wow. in a two year period mentioned cake. And so all now for us, this is like linking together. You have Brexit, boring trade negotiation. You have cake, yum, yum, yum. You keep making the connection together this is like the biggest national hypnosis program we've ever seen. <laughs> you know, I mean, it makes Paul McKenna's stuff look lightweight. You know, here you've got the prime minister and the whole of the national media saying Brexit is, is a slice cake or Brexit is a pie going in the oven, you know, and it makes us hungry then for that particular outcome. Yeah, and hunger is a you know a very um, it's a good emotion. It's a very, everyone can feel it, can't they? But do you think it it's in, do you think that's intuitive from Boris, or is it because because when he was a, the European correspondent for the Daily Telegraph, mm -hmm. uh, he was writing about you know they're going to stop us having our shaped bananas that we like. They're going to stop us having the prawn cocktail crisps. You know, yes. the, the most British thing ever. So yeah. do you think it's intuitive and he went from that or is it or was it, you know, it's thought out and this is the. It's really thought out. I've known I've known five or six people who have written for Boris over the years. Nothing he says is by accident. It's all deliberate. The man is a writer. He's a writer before anything else with an incredible gift for language. And he thinks very carefully. And you can see sometimes when he's being interviewed that he pauses and he's really he's struggling to find the right phrase he's a perfectionist with, with language and so I'm absolutely convinced that he's deliberate it, it, it's deliberate and that stuff I mean on bendy bananas and on kippers and prawn cocktail crisps I mean you know it, it was genius he's no one for years Brad no one gave a shit about the European Union. I remember going to weekly meetings at Downing Street about European communication, specifically about European communications. We used to get together, it was Monday afternoon, and we'd go through the grid, we'd talk about messages, and we'd look at the recent polls. Now, the problem year after year was no one gave a shit about Europe while the Prime Minister was trying to convince people of the benefits of, of, of Europe. And it was Boris who got people caring by giving us, by speaking to our stomachs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Genius. I, I'm really sorry, having started, Brent, by talking about long sentences and people who use long sentences. <laughs> I'm conscious now that some of my sentences are running into like the thousands of, of words. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, I'm delighted that you are speaking and I'm not one of those podcasters who's going to talk all over you. I want to let you hear what you've got to say. Now, um, just going back to, um, you know, politicians and the possibility of changing their language. I just wanted to touch on something that was really, really emotional in, in the book um, about changing the language for your daughter's insulin injections. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really massively important for parents around around the world, actually, to hear this because it's really really important can you can you expand on what you did there with your with your daughter yeah, in can, yeah. so my, my um eldest daughter lottie she's 12 now she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when she was four years old um and we we went to the hospital and uh received the diagnosis we we knew what it what it was that she had because my wife is a type 1 diabetic as well so as soon as um, she was exhibiting the symptoms like she was very, very thirsty. She kept needing to go to the loo. We were like, oh, God, you know, we knew what it was. We, we went to the hospital and they checked her sugars and we could see that her sugars were through the roof, which basically meant she was diabetic. And they are then explaining to my daughter, my daughter's four years old, so she's, she's, you know, communicative and receptive. And the nurses and doctors were talking to her. And they, they, they uh, were talking about, about how she needed to have a jab and a shot of insulin. You know, in the language of jabs and, and shots is obviously the, this kind of war imagery, which is prevalent in, in medicine. I was speech writer for the Department for Health, and I've written a lot about health, and everyone talks about fighting disease, combating disease. Now, of course, we do get it in COVID. We're battling COVID. And a key weapon is uh, um, the vaccine. And 
Um, this is, it, it does come instinctively and intuitively, this kind of language, particularly to people who have been trained, people who have been to medical school. We all understand you fight disease, you battle disease, but of course to someone who's just four years old and is just being introduced to this whole idea, it's not very good. And they gave her, I, I remember they gave her a, a magazine which was prepared by the American Medical Association called What's Up With Ella that had a little cartoon to explain to children what diabetes is. And it showed that when you eat anything with sugar or carbohydrate in, you have these nasty little green monsters in your bloodstream, aliens who are attacking you and who are threatening to attack your uh, kidneys and all of your um, vital organs. So what you need to do is then inject the insulin. And this is a superhero goes in with guns to shoot down the little green monsters. Now, for someone who's not got diabetes, like I, I didn't, seeing this cartoon was like, that's a really good explanation of what diabetes is actually, and what you have to do, your responsibility um, to, 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 to treat it. Um, however, of course, for a four-year-old child, to tell them they've got little green aliens like crawling around their bloodstream and you then need to shoot it, inject yourself with soldiers, shoot it down, just like completely wrong. So we were like, we're not going to use this sort of language. We're not going to use this sort of language. So instead, we still to this day, I mean, I wrote that book, I think in 2013, 2014, and I, I wrote it in the book about how we called um, her bag DB and it was, and it became, it's a person, <laughs> you know, that, that, um, goes everywhere with her and we still call it DB to this day. She'll still call, she'll still have a DB for the rest of her life. I have no doubt whatsoever. So we changed the language, changed the way that it felt. So it was no longer war imagery, but instead like this is what keeps you in charge, you know, and puts you in control. So that's the kind of way that metaphors can be changed. You change the metaphor. It's key to changing people's, the way people think, and see the world and therefore of course how they behave really important stuff yeah um another piece that jumped out from the book for me was uh about leaders because it's uh, i mean the whole book is about the language of leadership of course but actually i think it's it's, it's very important for people around the world who are interested in people if you've got a job and a manager or you've ever listened to what a politician has to say, you should read this book. Anyways, but in the book, you describe that there's, a, there's almost like a template for uh, leaders and they must be strong, sincere and sexy. Yeah. Right. And so I wanted to think I wanted to ask you how how many of those uh, characteristics do you think Donald Trump has? Or basically the question is, do you think that Trump is sexy? <laughs> Well, I mean, when I say sexy, I mean, the trouble is with me, because I'm a, a bloody speechwriter, everything has to be in the rule of three and everything yeah. has to be iterative. So health sense, the strong, sincere and, and sexy. I mean, the, the thing is, is that he's, um, he, he's, let, let me just, I, before ex answering the question directly, let me just go back a little bit. You think back to the historic role of leaders through the course of history. You know, you become leader of a tribe or a group of people by showing that you can look after that tribe, that group, and ensure their continuous, their continuance thereafter. And so that's kind of my starting point, you know, that we're still primarily instinctive creatures, despite all of our training, all of our education. When we're looking for leaders, it's very, very instinctive, very instinctive. The way that we do it and of course one of the ways that you ensure the continuance of the tribe or the group is is through mating <laughs> you know and i don't think anyone can doubt that you know donald trump is is very active or has been very active through the course of his life in that area and so he he does he ticks he ticks that kind of box. But I think that's, it is something which, which goes on just at an instinctive level and people will deny it. People will say, I vote, you know, when I, I'm deciding who to vote for, I do it based on their policies and it's really, really rational. And it's a load of, it's a load of hogwash, it really is. I mean, there's this wonderful guy, what's his name? Alexander Todolov, I wanna say. 
at Princeton University who did this famous brilliant study um, about 15 years ago where he showed people pictures of politicians and he asked them to say who they thought was the more competent of the two pictures that he was showing them and I think it was with 70% accuracy they were able to predict who had gone on to win that election based on nothing more than a quick first impression of someone's face. That's how instinctive these kind of judgments are. Uh, and his study has now been replicated all around the world, you know, in about 20 countries, including in the UK. So it was a face, was it? Because uh, also I, I've read that um, if the, the size, the height the, of the president, just talking about America for a moment, that since something like 18, whatever, the tallest candidate has won every time, apart from two yeah. instances. It's incredible. Yeah, I think that might be right. And, and another one is about, it's ever since the introduction of televised debates, every single one, bar one, I think, it's been the one with the deeper voice. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that is that, that right as well? So, yeah, I mean, it's really, um, it's quite disturbing, actually, once you look into some of this stuff you realize just how <laughs> low people's thoughts are it doesn't matter it, what the speech writer wrote it's whether they've got a deep voice or they're yeah, just, it, exactly just put him on stilts and make him smile and you know we'll be fine forget about the speech now you spoke about the magic of threes and you know lots of people know this they probably don't realize it when it's happening but you know you hear about the mars a day where she work rest and play and veni vidi vici and all this stuff um and the, the power of rhymes, uh, does it, does it, is it only in Western society or does it go across cultures? Because you, you work with CEOs in, in Asia and Africa and does it work across cultures as well, this rhyming? Totally, yeah. So there's a, a wonderful study uh, that was done on the phrase, you know, red sky at night, shepherd's delight. Yeah. Uh, and the study that was done on that showed that I think there's a variation on that rhyme in about 70 or 80 different wow. languages. We all learn things. We, you know, we all have these kind of aphorisms that are, are rhyming. And it's just, it suggests a stronger connection between the ideas. It just creates the illusion, this is right. The thing about the rule of three, you know, my theory on this is that our thoughts and our body language are fundamentally interconnected. And so hence, I think the kind of, you know, when we say on the one hand this, on the other, we do that very naturally in conversation. We think we're weighing uh, subjects or ideas up. And so for people to then say something which sounds well thought through, you do a rhetorical contrast. So ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And I think that the rule of three kind of builds on that. So you have this idea of dum, dum, da dum, you know? So it's like on the one hand this, or given point A, given point B, we can conclude point C. You know, so it, that's, that's my theory to it, but different people have other theories. But what we can say for certain is that putting it in a three makes it more credible than it coming in a four. It works, we don't know why. Is it known where it comes from? Is it the Greeks or maybe Christianity, the Father, the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost? Is it something to do with that? Is, it, is there an no, origin? I, I, think, I think the origin is that embodiment. And so mm -hmm. it's actually, it's, it's kind of hardwired in our brain. Our comprehension of the world is seen through the, we conceptualize, da 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 da, -da. Mm -mm -mm. So it kind of comes from that. And then in actual fact with religion, religion uses rhetoric all, o all over the place, you know, Old Testament, New Testament. I mean, the use of rhetorical devices in, in both, not, you know, rule of three, like you say, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, but also the rhetorical uh, contrast. Wonderful Francis of Assisi, <laughs> you know, where there is discord, may we bring harmony. It's famously yeah. quoted by um, Margaret Thatcher. So. I, I think it's all about embodied language, actually, that and embodied con cognition. That's what it dates back to, which would explain why it works in all sorts of different cultures across the world, because there's something about the way our brains programmed to think through our bodies. Okay. Um, 
I'm just wondering, like, with rhyming, because in, in the book you explain about the, the power of rhyme and it's very innate. And I'm wondering if like the like the world domination of rap and hip hop, if it's because the high frequency, the, the the occurrence of the rhymes is much quicker than in, let's say, the Beatles songs. I wonder if it's got anything to do with that, that, you know, the rhyme is just so instinctive that people just immediately get into that energy or something. Yeah. Yeah. I Well, I mean there's a few things going on. I think first you have the kind of the connection with um, what you've heard as a kid when you're taught things as children, we're often taught things through rhymes. So you, you have that, but then also as well, you have the satisfaction, I think, of recognizing, oh, we've got a rap song and there's a pattern emerging here. How long can they keep, how long can the rapper keep this pattern going for? Because of course, like you say, the Beatles, you know, um, it was you, they were doing well to, in their early songs. Their rhymes were kind of like you do, true, through, and you know, really basic. Whereas you listen to more up to date rappers, and I mean, it's incredible. They'll have like kind of seven or eight rhymes in a, in a go, and sometimes they're words you barely even know yourself. You know, yeah, higher so, complexity of word as well. Much higher complexity. So. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the Beatles language is probably like four year old or five year olds, you know, whereas, it, yeah, you, 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 you look to like your Dizzy Rascals or your M&Ms or, or whatever. And it's probably much more like, I don't know, you know, 13 years old or something, something like that. It's not yeah. quite college level. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so look, you've, you've written. Uh, let me let me show you the. Let me show everyone the, the books because it's always good to show the digital versions as well. There's yeah. uh, You're Not Human, How Words Kill, and, and the audio book of Winning Minds. I mean, I wanted to speak to you about this because the, the narrator is fantastic. I consume an enormous amount of audio books, and it's Glenn McCready, who I'd never experienced before, did you, right. did you choose him or what happens in the process? No, I, I, the publisher chose him. It was all, you know, <laughs> I, I was, um, they, they said, we're going to do an audio book. Um, and I said, oh, brilliant. You know, I'd love to do that. And, and they just replied saying, yeah, we've got someone lined up. And I was like, no, I could do it. And they were like, no, we've got someone lined up. And I was like, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it was like, I don't know, they were saying something about my my voice or something like that. No, I shouldn't well, be so sensitive. I shouldn't be so sensitive. But Glenn McCready, he, he's got the most amazing voice. And he did like all of uh, Ben Elton's uh, books, I, I think. And he's got, yeah, he's got a wonderful tone. It's a bit weird, though. I've not listened to the whole thing you don't listen you know once you've written a book the last thing you want to do is look at it again to be honest with you um because you find you're like oh god I could have written that better it just bugs you um but it was so weird listening to him do it because you'll remember the first paragraph the first paragraph describes me and my wife going to see a concert in Hyde Park where a speech is given by Boris Johnson and that's how it starts and so it starts off with this wonderful voice going it was a hot summer's day and me and my wife, Lucy, went, and it was like, there's another man talking about my wife. <laughs> no, but he is really, really good because he, he gives the emphasis, he gives the emotion and not all narrators do that. I mean, normally when it's not the author who's narrating, I always think like, because mm, I feel there's something missing. But he really, really adds to it. So highly recommended. You know, if you're thinking, oh, audio book, uh, it was not narrated by Simon. You know, but he's really, really good. But I wanted to speak about the process of book writing because so many people out there have, you know, dreams of getting down and writing a book. And um, how long does it take you? How long? How what chunk of your life do you have to give to writing a book? It's. Um... It's a slow process and a careful process and a considered process. It, you can't do it quickly. I think each of my books has taken probably about four years wow. from, start, from start to finish. And it takes a lot of time just to get the concept right, actually, and to think, what's your, what's your thing? How are you going to pitch this? So just to take 
um, I've still got all of the, you know, somewhere on my computer, I've still got all of the early working drafts of all of my books. And you just see the way it, it evolves, that it starts off with this concept, then it bends to that concept, then that, you know, and then finally the publisher will say, we want this concept. And you're like, okay, <laughs> that's what I'll write to then, you know. Um, so it, it's really, it's, it's really slow, but you've just got to keep going with it. Now, I, 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 I will tend to do it in kind of short bursts. And so, and, and I'll do it during, my work is very seasonal. Speech writing work is very seasonal. Basically, all of the big speeches in the year are given between September and March. And so then the rest of the year, you, you'll get the odd thing come in, speeches to employees, stuff like that. But the conference season is September to March. And so I, I'll do little on my books between then. It's something that keeps me buzzing over during those, um, you know, during the summer months, basically, where I'll do a lot of reading, a lot of reading. Each book that I've written has probably um, taken about 250 books that I've read wow. to then to then produce, you know? And so all the time I'm kind of considering the issue and just getting more stuff in. It's like that wonderful Peggy Noonan quote about reading is collecting wisdom and writing is spending it, you know? Um, but it's, I, I enjoy it a lot. You know, I, I, I love writing books, love it. And, and obviously they're nonfiction. Um, do you plan out like you would the plot uh, of, a, of a fiction book do you plan it the whole way and then start to write it or do you just go for it first chapter and then do a linear here it comes like what's your planning style well I mean I mean let me talk you through just briefly like two of the books that I've written actually so the the first the first one speech writing the expert guide um which came out in 2010 I think and it was back in 2005 that I had the first germ of an idea for that. And I was like, I thought maybe let's do a, a, a one hour speech writer, like, you know, the one minute manager, that yeah. kind of thing. So mm -hmm. You've got an hour to write a speech. Let me write a book that just walks you through that process, how to do it in, in an hour. And I was playing with that. And then I had a, a more pompous, lofty idea about a book on the art of oratory. And then I kind of changed the idea and started writing it that way. And then it got to 2008 and I was like, I need to really start working. I need to take this to completion now. And I remember I always set myself annual targets, like personal targets, professional targets. And I set, me the, set, set myself the target, I'm gonna get a book deal by the end of this year for my speeches book. And it got to literally end of November. I had no book deal. And I was like, right, I've got to get this done. So I put, wrote a proposal out. Then literally I got an email randomly from Hale Publishers saying, we're looking for someone to write a book about speech writing. Would you be interested? <laughs> and I was like, well, it just so happens. <laughs> Um, and I then sent them the proposal. We signed the contract before Christmas. And so that was, and they were like, they, they had a series, the Expert Guide series, the Expert Guide to Screenwriting, the Expert Guide to Poetry Writing. And they said, We'd, we want your book to be part of that series. So they gave me the title. They gave me the premise. My own ideas were then out the window. And I just wrote, okay, the Expert Guide to Speech Writing. Brilliant, you know. There we go. That's my theme. So that was pretty much directed by the publisher. My more recent books, You Are Not Human, that was my, I think, unique idea. You know, I don't think anyone else really got that about political dehumanization and the way it was systemic and there was a pattern to it, and it was strategic, and, and it had been in place for thousands of years. And that was my unique idea. So then I had to pitch it to publishers. That was much more flipping difficult. My God, that was a process. It's much easier when you have a publisher come to you and say, will you write this book? Then trying to pitch it to publishers. And it was, I mean, it wasn't, it really wasn't easy actually. So with Winning Minds, my second book, Winning Minds was the same. 
Macmillan, the head of Macmillan, CEO of Macmillan, saw me gave a give a speech, and he said, you should write a book on that. And we'd publish it for you. So again, that was similar to number one. Then number three was my own idea. I had an agent. She punted it out to all of the publishers, all the big publishers. Um, and all of them were like, you know, it's a good idea, but, you know, we're it's a bit negative. It's a bit downbeat. You know, if he was to write something like this, we'd like it. And I was like, no, this really matters. It's the age of Trump, the age of Brexit. And I was like, someone needs to expose the language of dehumanization. None of the big publishers wanted to know at all. They were like, people come into Waterstones and they're seeking a book that will make them a better person. They will buy a book that will make them a better person. They don't want to buy a book that will make them miserable. Your book's going to make them miserable. And I was like, but it's important. <laughs> you know? and, and they didn't want to, they didn't, they were, they, 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 so I didn't get a deal from, um, Penguin, Random House, HarperCollins, not any of those. And instead it was uh, Biteback, who's a brilliant publisher. They're a brilliant publisher and they're the best political publisher in, in the country. And they publish from the whole breadth of political opinion. And I was so delighted when they picked it up and they were just, straight away they got it. They could see this was a political argument that needed to be pushed for. They changed the title of it. So I think I'd called it Language That Kills was my title and they were like language is a negative word people don't want to know about language they said and I then proposed to them you are not human and we, we went make it personal yeah 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 yeah, yeah. well uh, they people go into the bookshop to be a better person well, it gives you a complete understanding of what's going on so th th was it was it in draft form or proposal? How do you how do you approach the publishers? Do you have to get a chunk of it done, or it's just a synopsis, or how is it? So I, I've got um, an, an agent who who guides me, who guided me through with "You Are Not Human" and who got me the deal with "Bite Back," and who's now um, punting out book number four, <laughs> actually, uh, to publishers. Um, so that's going out at the moment. So the, there's a proposal which is going around publishers at the moment. To, to people who are wondering what does a proposal look like? I mean, I can tell you what a proposal looks like. It looks like a book. <laughs> it's effectively a book. So, so what the publishers have from me now is 25,000 words. Bearing wow. in mind, the final draft is 70,000 words. So it's already pretty well completely written in outline. Uh -huh. So that so you've got the whole narrative. So you can read that proposal and you're like, I've got the essence of the book. You know, so anything else that will go in there, we'll go into more detail, we'll elaborate on the stories, we'll provide more colour, you know, all of these sorts of things. But they basically have the book. And it's my agent who um you know, taught me to do that. Felicity Bryan, literary associates, they're they're brilliant agents. Um, and yeah, so, so it's so for budding writers out there, you either have to put in three years of work and then wait for the the lucky email, or you put in loads of work, twenty five thousand words, and then start bunting it round. The work yeah, has to well, be put in. Yeah, and my main advice to to budding writers who are listening to this today is really concentrate on getting your pitch right. In actual fact, the the thing that sells it to publishers and to agents is the title of the book and the back cover. You know, you've got to get those 250 words right. <laughs> you know, and like, as I was saying to you about, oh, shall it be the one hour speech writer or shall it be the art of oratory? Shall it be speech writing in the expert guide? They're fundamentally different books. Those three books are fundamentally different books. And it's your overall proposition, the concept of the book, that's what says whether it will sell or not. And so in the first instance, instead of it, don't write your 25,000 words, don't bother writing the first chapter, get that right, get your concept and your pitch right and really visualize it. Could you really see this in a bookshelf, you know, in a bookshop, you know? Is your back blurb really, really, is it brilliant, you know? And it doesn't have to be a lot of words. And that's the thing. You get that right. And you've then, I mean, not only will it sell the book, but it'll give you your marching orders as a writer. This is now what I'm writing to. And and do you have to, as a, a proposal, do, you said you have to get the, the title right and the back, and the back cover. Do you have to get the, the title page, the front cover, the visual, or that's much later in the process? 
I, I do. For me, I do. Um, but I'm a very visual kind of person and visual thinker and all of that. But for me, I, I, I want to see it. And literally what I've done um, with the last two books, I've mocked up a PDF of the overall cover that I've then kept at the side of my desk, which again gives me my marching orders. This is what I'm writing to. Don't lose track. This is your overall message. Because I think it's so easy when you're a writer, and particularly when you're writing a book and it's over such a long period of time, three, four years or whatever, your, your mind can wander, your focus can wander, and you end up writing several different books. Whereas of course the publisher just wants one coherent line of argument through the whole of the book. And so like with, you know, the, the big non-fiction books like Nudge, Tipping Point, whatever. I mean, it's Nudge, it's Tipping Point. You know, they're the ideas of those, the rules of influence, you know, Cialdini. You know, the, the title tells you exactly what the contents of the book are, is, are, are going to be. So interesting. I'm, I'm sure that so many uh, budding authors out there have never heard about this, about getting the back cover right. That's really, really valuable stuff. Yeah. Um, just one more question about the, the writing process. Now, the, 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 the book, Winning Minds, it's really funny. It's like, you know, the, the jokes are in there. Uh, to you know peppered throughout to really uh, you know liven it up and you know it's I'm just wondering like did you put them in because you, you're you've got the natural comedy that comes out in your sentences you want to push the the comedy at every stage or did you write the serious stuff and then go back and put the jokes in like I need a joke here to get the rhythm going and how do you I, work I'm, with the humor I, I'm a big believer in the power of humor for getting messages across um, I, I know for myself, I have the attention span of a gnat, you know, so I need, so I need that promise of a joke to keep me going <laughs> as, as well. So I know I enjoy it. And I think um, a lot of the stuff that you've got in Winning Minds is actually stuff that I have said before in speeches or on workshops or in one-to-one -one sessions. And so jokes that just kind of come out naturally you know, or spontaneously, I'm like, oh, I've got to store that. <laughs> you know, this is like my, my, this is what I tell basically. It's, you know, the ability to, you know, um, to, to, to explain how good communication works. And so I always kind of um, lob them in there, but I'm glad you enjoyed them because a lot of them are actually quite puerile. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like i've never once missed a cheap innuendo you know <laughs> but do you put them in as you go or you know in a like the i don't know version three draft eight you know do you go back and you go oh i need a, i need something here god i don't know i think i think they kind of it's more like my line of argument my patter on an issue will develop over time mm -hmm. and I'll just I'll see the opportunity for a gag normally later once I've worked out what my point is so I'm like so if, for instance if I'm talking about um the power of pronouns so you know whether or not you're saying you've got to do this or we've all got to do this well that was um something that I'd read about in an academic study James Pennybaker professor of linguistics University of Austin Texas he's written a brilliant book the secret life of pronouns which I really enjoyed and I thought there's an important lesson there for speechwriters about how if you want your text to feel less combative, more conciliatory, then you should just take your speech and we all over it, you know. And so it's like it starts off with the, the message, the piece of advice. And then I'm like, oh, I can see there's an opportunity for a little cheap pun here. Let's. I can't and I can't resist it. I throw my hands up, you know, sometimes when I'm presenting this stuff, you, you'll get three quarters of people like we'll have a little chuckle and the rest will just go, oh, God. <laughs> so last question about book writing. How difficult is it to say, OK, it's finished. That's it. It's gone. I'm letting it go. It's really satisfying, actually. I think for the for the last uh, that last run of the process, so basically after you get your book deal, you've got, got your book deal, and then I think from then it's normally about six to nine months to actually finalise the text. And when, when you get to the end of it, you, you, you're you just like, yeah, I, I, I'm done with this now. <laughs> you know, you're just like, there, there, there's, there's no more I can do of this. I think as well, you can hit a point 
where you actually realize that your amendments are making it worse, not better. So you can get to like the thing that a lot of, you know, particularly with the speech writing discipline, you, you, you learn that good writing is always about cutting stuff out. That's always, that always makes a speech better. You know, so someone gives you a 40 minute speech, you're like, I can make this much better. Make it a 20 minute speech. You know? oh. <laughs> Just cut all of that stuff out. And when you get to that position with a, with a book, obviously you're then in, in difficulty. You can say things in whatever length of time you like. You know, you start off with an 80,000 word book and then it turns into a TED talk, which is 15 minutes. And then you do something for TikTok, which is like 57 seconds or, or whatever. And it's the same kind of message, but just to, to suit the reader. And a, a book, you know, it needs to be more considered. You need to, you know, not be like kind of, you know, banging the reader over the head, but rather instead like walking them on a bit of a journey and being a bit more nuanced and being like, well, on the one hand this, on the other hand that, and maybe, maybe, and just kind of like planting thoughts in the reader's mind and letting them draw their own conclusions, being far more kind of accommodating, I think, to the reader's own impressions than you are in a speech, where I think in a speech you can, with charisma, energy, pace, you can just whiz people along a lot more quickly and be a lot more forceful, I think. Okay. Um, let, let's move on to speech writing, your super expertise. So um, I just wanted to delve in by saying, like, what do you think of the old business adage that I've heard? I, I was in corporate for quite a while and I heard this many times with about a speech. Tell the audience, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you just told them. What do you think of that approach? Yeah, well, I think that is like, you know, but, um, stamp on your audience's head and then tell, tell, tell them your audience, tell your audience you're going to stamp on their head, then stamp on their head and then tell them their head's just been um, stamped on. It's not, it's not the best, it's really not the best advice. I, I think, you know, rather instead, good communication, where, whether it's a presentation or a speech or a book or a film or, or whatever, will take people on a bit of a journey. You start in one place, you end in another. So you start with a problem you wind up with a solution. You start in the past and you end up in the future. You start with fear, you end up with hope, you know, and it's far more doing that kind of, uh, that sort of journey, I think is pleasing for audiences. And, and for, the, for the people listening, there's some very useful content that you've got on YouTube and even TikTok now on the ways to start a speech. So check out Simon on those channels. Um, now, when you accept a job, maybe with a new person that you haven't worked with before, what is the first step that you go through? Well, um, yeah, I mean, it, it depends. It depends what they're looking for, really. If they're looking for long-term support or if they're just looking for a one-off, they have one speech that's coming up, up to which they, they want to do. If they're looking for long-term support, then generally I'll, I'll go and meet them And pre-COVID. Now we'll do it over Zoom. You know, we'll just have a chat and just feel the, the chemistry, you know? Um, and I've got to feel it too, you know? There, there have been a couple of people that I've met that have just been like, oh, I'm not quite feeling the magic here, you know? And, and then I've just sent a polite, you know, in actual fact, looking at my schedule for the next few months, I'm a little bit busy. <laughs> um, and now I've, I've, not, I've not gone ahead with it. But if it's someone, um, if it's someone who just wants a one-off speech, then what I will do with them, I have a kind of a really quick fire speech writing service that I will offer, which is what most of my clients want actually. They just want to get that first draft that has been professionally produced and then they want to own it. And it's great they do want to own it. They must own it. They're the ones that have got to deliver it. Their career lasts on it. So what I will generally do when I'm working with clients, I will meet with them first thing in the morning, 7 a.m., 8 a.m. However early they want to start is how early I will start. And then we'll have a briefing meeting. And I have all of these super questions that I, I ask to get the very best out of them, just to get right to the core of their soul, you know, which I, I will do really very quickly. You know, it's got to be very, very efficient because for these people, time is not just money. Time is a lot of money. You know, you're CEO of a big company. Your time is like 250 grand 
um, an hour by one calculation, you know. So you've got to be really, really efficient about it. But, but is that random stuff? Like, you know, what was the last thing you listened to on Spotify if you're trying to get to the soul of the person? Sometimes there's a bit of just the kind of serendipitous, like just let's just wander around and see what falls out. But I have my systematic questions that mm -hmm. I'll ask as well. You know, so like who would come to your dream dinner party? This takes people like, you know, five, six minutes to do. And the answers you get to that, I'm like, I'm really beginning to know you now. You know, when were the times of your life when you felt warmest? And when were the times when you felt most cold? You know, using the metaphor to kind of suggest happiness, unhappiness, distance, you know, and then you'll get some good stories out from, it. you know, so I have a few different questions that I'll, I'll work through. But we did. So we do that first thing in the morning, then they'll check in with me. I'll, 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 so I'll spend an hour with them, maybe 90 minutes. And then on the, we'll agree a concept for the speech, an outline structure that we'll just talk back and forth. So I'll pitch the idea to them, then they'll pitch it back to me, kind of go back and forth until we feel we've got something good. Um, and then I'll get writing. They'll then check in with me, normally around about 11, 11.30. I'll ask them any questions I have to ask. They'll give me some early feedback on how the draft is shaping up. And then we'll be all done by lunchtime, you know, and I'll get them a draft, which they're then happy with. Lunchtime can sometimes stretch to two, or even 2.30, <laughs> hence my, my, my coming on late today. But, you know, generally, that, that's the way that will work. And that works best for me, you know, because then I can just immerse myself in their world. Writing a speech really does require that you pretend you're them, you're the client for a set period of time. So, you know, I can't carry that around all of the time. You know, so, you know, like, give me four weeks to write your speech. That's not going to work for me because then I'm, I'm, I will, because of the kind of person I am, I'll have that like not in my stomach for four weeks. Whereas for me, just like, right, I'll, I'll work for you for five hours, six hours. I'll give you my absolute all. And I guarantee you will have a draft of your speech at the end of it. It won't be perfect. And you'll want to make changes to it. But that... That for my clients is a, is, is a really great deal. And they, they love it, actually. Sometimes they come back to me afterwards and say, would you just have another look at it? You know, I've changed it around a little bit. Would you now? now? Absolutely, you know. Um, but that, yeah, that as a working model, that works really, really well. And as I said, I've worked in corporate and um, I was actually making, um, uh, I, did, I did various things, but uh, I remember doing some uh, PowerPoints for the CEO. And the, the problem is there's too much that they want to say and put in and it gets longer and longer and longer and longer. Is that the case generally with people who are wanting to make a speech that they've got way too much stuff that they want to say and it's more about editing down? Yeah, I mean, uh, PowerPoint's a flipping nightmare. I mean, it really is a nightmare. It's a nightmare for the person producing it. It's a nightmare for people who are listening to it. And I, I think here, what you've got to sometimes, not often, but sometimes I do work with people who are doing PowerPoint presentations and I need to help them, like, you know, um, spruce it up. I have literally just been working on one, literally just been working on one. And, and there... The trouble with PowerPoint is it pushes you to mixed metaphors. The software is actually, you know, designed to push you towards mixed metaphors. So you don't have that clarity of idea. One second, it'll show you a seed being planted. The next second, it will show you a journey. And the next second, it will show you, you do you know what I mean? And it's yeah. like, audience isn't getting anything straight. So one of the things that I will do when I'm working with a client who's doing a PowerPoint is I'll say, you know, okay, we need a clear message running through this, a clear metaphorical image running through this. And so let's go with motion, you know? Let's, it feels to me like motion is the one we should be going to. So let's make sure all of the images in our slides are say in motion, you know? And make sure that the language is motion metaphors. And then the audience will be able to understand it. Whereas if you've got a journey a seed and a plant 
you know, and then um, a picture of a family and then concentric circles and stuff like that. It's bewildering, absolutely bewildering for the audience. But, you know, just a little thought like that can make a huge lot of difference. But one of the things I think, and I, I'm sure you'll have found this in corporate life as well, is sometimes with PowerPoint, the purpose of it is actually to give people something that they can then refer to afterwards. So that if it's like the quarterly results or whatever, analysts will want to go away and go through them in slow time. So you, you have to cater for that, but also you need to cater for the just the, the feel at the time. And for that, that's kind of more where I will offer my expertise, just on how, on first impressions of language, is this coherent? What are the messages you're landing here? This is back to Boris, isn't it? With his uh, food metaphor with Brexit. It was not only on message, it was on metaphor. That yeah. the, the string went throughout. Um, and do you find that when you've done, when you've created a speech that, you know, uh, maybe a CEO passes it through his leadership team, perhaps, and then it comes back, as you say, in winning minds, you say like the HR guys into cars so that, that the car metaphor gets thrown in. And does it ever come back to you? And, and like what you wrote has been mauled and mangled and there's like loads of different metaphors and you have to go back to the beginning. Is it difficult? No, no. Um, no, not, no. I mean, CEOs are so powerful. You know, I mean, it's much harder, I think, being a government minister. When, if you're a secretary of state or even a prime minister and you want to say stuff, you've got a million people who have every right and power to veto you saying that. Whereas when you're a CEO, you're master pretty much of all you purvey. You know, and CEOs can get away with a lot more. It's trickier. Where it's tricky is actually where I've helped out writing for board members like CTO, CFO, all of these kind of guys, head of HR. They're the ones where it's more tricky because then the CEO may have ideas about what they're saying or their fellow board members might want to, you know, that's trickier that's then much trickier but CEOs can you know in my experience they've got a lot of power and and they'll they, they normally like um what I do because my whole approach is basically what do you want to say I'll help you say it whereas they will regard people in their companies generally as being a bar to them so I'm I'm the CEO's best friends you know <laughs> I'm their ally and it's the company who works is working against them sometimes. So, so what would you say is like the maximum number of points that you should try to get across in a speech? Because people, are, you often hear people saying that you should only try and do three things. But I think in the book you said that maximum is seven. Or so, what what would be your advice to people who are giving an important speech about the number of uh, things that they can say that their audience will retain? Well, I think it's more about feelings, you know rather than points, that when you ask people, what did you think of that speech? They will always reply with a feeling, you know? And, oh, it was really inspiring. You know, oh, it was a bit much. Oh, it was a bit boring, you know? Um, and so my, my, sense, my thing is always, how do you want to make them feel? And then start with that. So you, you're making an inspirational speech, then do that. You want to see people, you want to see people sitting there at the end with big smiles actually feeling positive and like really you know on their feet like punch in the air you know that's what that's what you want to get to um that's the way i think rather than how many points can you get across in terms of maximum but if you're going for points getting across of course it's three <laughs> but i'd never guarantee they would be retained it's it's quite surprising whenever you see speeches being properly analyzed and like you know questionnaire goes to everyone afterwards and says, what was the main message you took from brand speech? You know, you get 700 responses, you get 700 different responses, you know? And with the exception, in my experience, of where you do something a little bit edgy and you give them a single new metaphor <laughs> or something like that, and then you might be able to get it, you might be able to get it through, you know? Like we've got smashed through the glass ceiling. That could get through. Three points, not so much. One metaphor, one message, you know, that could get through. And what's your advice on timing? Is it, uh, you know, in the 
you should go for like the TED talk kind of timing, 18, 14 to 18 kind of minutes, or, you know, is there, is there value in doing like, here's my message, bang, mic drop, one minute. Yeah. I, I mean, it's different strokes for different folk, I think, isn't it? And it's, we, we like receiving information in different ways, don't we? So sometimes you do just want a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, you know? And, and so, so that TikTok, you know, the little TikTok video that I did, which is like, is one minute, six techniques to speak like a leader. Um, and a lot of people have loved that. I mean, I put it, um, I put it on TikTok almost as an experiment. It was my first TikTok post and it had a hundred thousand views within two days. It was phenomenal, you know, and I think people like that kind of thing, but then you have other people who, who will like slow, more careful deliberation. So you've downloaded the audio book of Winning Minds. That's what, six hours or something, is it? Or seven hours or something? Yeah. You know, so that's a few different car journeys, isn't it? Where you've got it all, whatever, where you've got it on in the background. Um, so I, I think- Never in the your... background, come on, Simon. <laughs> Front of mind, so you're too kind then, yeah. Um, but I think it's it's putting your content and your ideas out there, I suppose, in a range of formats so that people can go into whatever level of depth they want to go into the topic for. But a lot of people now just want it in the most bite-sized chunks. So this is the challenge now, isn't it? It's like, how can you tweet this? How can you say this in less than a minute? And it's a good discipline. For, for all of us, I remember when I was asked to do my TEDx talk, thinking, how can I com cram my 80,000 word book into a 1500 word TEDx talk? And you're like, this is impossible. But the next thing you know, you are, you're doing a 60 seconds TikTok video and thinking that's, that was it. That's the best way to put this across. <laughs> and in your opinion, are the best speeches, are they the ones that are created by a wordsmith like yourself, but then the speech giver goes from that plan and then maybe goes off piste for a moment and really speaks passionately about something is that the the feelings that you're talking about is is that when the the real magic happens well they, they've got to own it i mean they have absolutely got to own it they've got to they've got to be speaking from their heart and soul where they deliver it so the range of exercises that i do with them you know is is to get them doing that kind of you know, really speaking from their heart and soul. So you really get the essence of who they are. So I'll get that from them, hopefully, in our early morning session, and it'll then be in their draft speech so that when they deliver it, they can summon up all of those feelings that they have on on the, that issue later. You know, you, you want them to do it in a controlled kind of way. You don't want them, like, wandering off, um, just doing something randomly because they might regret it so if like you, you this is an emotional moment and you, you're going to talk about you know your your you know a bereavement or something you know some family tragedy or whatever you want them to have thought that through and be prepared and ready to disclose it in a way that is right for them so you see Keir Starmer was on Piers Morgan life stories yeah last night. I, I saw the I I'm actually living in Berlin, so I, I didn't see the TV show, but I saw in the papers that he was on there, yeah. Yeah, and he, he went on and he talked about his mother dying and he cried on camera. Now, that's the kind of thing that would not have happened randomly. He'll have thought very carefully on his own, with his family, almost certainly, and with his inner team about whether or not he wanted to speak about that. And he took a decision, I do want to speak about that. I think that's important for whatever reason, you know, and therefore I'm going to do it, but on my terms, you know, and in a controlled manner. And, and that's the way it should be. If, if he went in there and that fell out randomly, that, that would be a mistake. You wouldn't necessarily want that because then he might have to deal with consequences he hadn't anticipated. Yeah. Now, you, you've you done, what, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 hours of this now in your career? God, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. You, you've developed this method and this relationship and rapport that you build with the with your clients. Um, now, people that wanted to get into speech writing, obviously, are 
the first stop is read your books, right? But what, what else would you recommend? Are there some like learned texts from back in the day that are essential reads? Yeah, well, I mean, I do training courses as well and I do coaching sessions and I've had, um, I, I've now, it's wonderful actually, because I love passing on to the next generation. So to people who are, are, are now in their 20s, early 30s, just starting out and, you know, inspiring them really, because it is the most wonderful job in the world, writing speeches. I do genuinely believe it's the best job. I, I feel blessed to have done this, you know, and and so I, I do um, all sorts of training courses, either online coaching or if not, we're back in the Groucho Club in London, which is what I do a wonderful three day speech writing extravaganza um, once a year um, where we, we, we get together. Yeah, it's fantastic. And we go to the comedy store and study improvisation along the way. And we get some academics in, we get journalists in. And so that teaches the art of speech writing really, really brilliantly. And, uh, you know, speech writers from uh, 10 Downing Street, from FCO, going all the way, all of the government departments send their speech writers on my uh, training courses, I'm very pleased to say, um, which is great fun. Great. And it, I love it. I love passing passing on and you know I am still a political junkie I stopped working in Whitehall myself 15 years ago but I love hearing all the gossip from the centre <laughs> as well <laughs> so it's great it's a privilege now, now nothing is ever perfect because that's totally subjective but when you craft what you consider to be a beautiful speech and it hits all the marks um what is it that achieves perfection for you? Do you get to see or hear the audio or see the speeches on video maybe? And then you go like, that was the one, that was absolute perfection. Do, do you ever, what, what is it that creates that feeling for you as a speech writer? Is it that the words came out as you crafted them or was it that plus the delivery or what is it that creates that amazing feeling for you? For me, like you say, it's subjective. And so I never count my own opinion, actually. My, my thing is, is watching the audience. That's mm -hmm. where I get my thrill, you know? But by the time the speech is actually being delivered, and I do always go and see my clients deliver their speeches whenever I can, you know, because it is, it's that essential, that's the way to evaluate whether or not you've really, really done a good job. And you learn as well. You see them adapt, you know, a sentence like mid, mid flow and you're like, oh. That, that hurts when you see them do that. You're like, oh, I, I could have done that one better. You know, that was a, that was a fail, but black mark there. But, the, you know, it comes with watching the audience. That's what I love. When you tell a story and you actually see members of the audience, as you do when you've told a story well with tears in their eyes, that's what you should get with a good story. When you, you, you've got a gag and the audience are, are actually split in their sides or you've put in there some kind of, you know, activity, something, some random thing where you've got everyone up and then, you know, and, and it works. That's, that for me is the real, yeah, you know, and you can track on Twitter now, of course, as well, when the speech is being delivered, you can see, you know, say certain lines being quoted and you're like, yeah. So that's the way I evaluate. It's the audience response that, that counts far more than my impression or listening to the speaker, it's the audience effect. That's what it's all about for me. Nice. And um, you, you spoke about tears in the eyes. Uh, what's the greatest speech from a movie that you've ever heard? The most straight motivating? Or... I'm straight there. Rocky Balboa. Yeah. Do you know the one I'm talking about? Rocky Six, Balboa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bal Do you, you, and you know the one I'm yeah. talking about. I it's, remember it's not how hard you get hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Come on, that I, that has put, is put in tears in my eyes. Just um, thinking of that quote, actually, that is absolutely that is. Um, that's but that brilliant. that's got to be Stallone has written that himself because he wrote the original Rocky all himself. But I'm, I'm think he went back to like being the absolute the sole scriptwriter for that one for the sixth one. I, is that right? I, I, I'm a big Stallone fan. It kind of upsets me because when people slag him off, because he is seen as being like kind of thick and Rambo and all of that sort of stuff. He, I mean, Rocky One is a work of art. That's like the ultimate indie art movie. It's 
absolutely yeah. it was made for less than a million dollars i think wasn't it it's you know yeah and yeah, he that's... insisted they wanted to cast someone else but he insisted it's quite dark in places like saturday night fever as well dark movie but yeah oh, so people remember... so that's another great people remember great... the set pieces my, my other favorite movie speech is the wolf of wall street you know where he's uh, leonardo dicaprio is addressing all of the traders yeah. that that is a great one for use of rhetorical devices so throughout that speech he uses rhymes he uses the rule of three uses repetition as metaphor um that's that's my second greatest yeah okay let's start wrapping up by going to your ted talk i mean you've done three tedx talks now no that's it yeah but um let's let's speak about uh how to how to speak like a leader mm. which has got like three gazillion views i think now <laughs> um so when you did that ted talk as a speech writer rather than a speech giver, how long did it take you to prepare for that? Was it like writing a book? <laughs> no, I mean, I got pretty well thrown into it, actually. So it was my um, good friend, the lovely Caroline Goider. I don't know whether you've come across Caroline. She'd be know. a great interviewee for you, actually. Look her up after, after this. She's, she's, she did a, a, a huge TEDx talk at Brixton. Uh, which had millions of views. She's written great books on gravitas. She's a body language expert. And TEDx Verona had asked her to speak. And I think she was either pregnant or had just had a baby. And so she said at the time, so she said, I can't do it, but ask Simon, he'd be good. Um, and so I got the invite with like about, I think about four weeks notice. And so I didn't have an awful lot of notice, but I'd wanted to do a TEDx talk for ages. And I was just like, oh, wow, this is my big, big, big opportunity. You know, I've always wanted to do it. And so it was very, very exciting. Such a thrill. You know, I've watched and enjoyed all the TED Talks and TEDx Talks uh, for years. And it, it, it was it was wonderful. But it was a big, big step for me because up until that time, you know, apart from doing the odd lecture at universities, I wasn't really a... Um, a keynote speaker where I wasn't being marketed as a keynote speaker. I did that TEDx talk. Instantly, the feedback from the room was incredible. You know, I mean, I was being treated like a rock star afterwards. It was so like such a head spin. It was like amazing. And on the back, as soon as it went on YouTube, I remember seeing it go up. And I think on the first day it had a thousand views. And I was like, oh, this is going well. And then within a week, it had 10,000 views. And I was like, blimey, within a month, it had 100,000 views. And then it was a million within a year. And it was, and on the back of that, I got invites to speak everywhere around the world, literally everywhere around the world. You know, within a year, I was, I gave a speech in Johannesburg. I gave a speech in Washington. I gave a speech in India, in Delhi, gave a speech in Manila. Kuala Lumpur and right across Europe, all on the back of the TEDx talk. So it was the most amazing. I mean, talk about how to market yourself as a keynote speaker. <laughs> Brilliant. So have you turned into a TEDx like rock star? You know, you have the eyeliner, the makeup, and then you have all the brown M&Ms taken out of the tray. <laughs> I haven't got the eyeliner on. I might, you know, <laughs> I might, um, I don't know. Oh, you're giving me a good idea there. Thanks for the advice. <laughs> Maybe I can notch this up a, up a couple of levels. Okay, but this this is this is interesting for people who would like you know I want to do a TEDx talk. Um, how did you practice? Did you have moments? And this same for your clients actually. I presume that you don't tell them to memorize every word. So how did you approach that? Did you have moment? There's not an auto cue that you see, is there? No, there's not. It's all memorized. So I, I do do encourage my clients to memorize the text if they possibly can. Ah, okay. I think it makes it so much better. It really then looks like you're speaking from the heart. If you've got an auto cue, that's fine. You can do that. But TEDx don't allow that unless you're Sheryl Sandberg or whatever, in which case they'll do whatever you want. Uh, but for most ordinary human beings, they, they will insist you, you memorize it. So the way that I did that, um, I, I walked and said it. So it was the old Roman system yeah. of remembering things by place. Through your you house. Know? And so not, yeah, not through my house though. I did it, um, well, I'm in the Brecon Beacons here and there's a beautiful uh, country hotel 
just o- over the valley from where I am. Um, and I, me and my wife went for a walk around the grounds and I, I said the text to her whilst we were going about. And then that locks it in my head. And I can still remember. And so then whenever I was working through the text, I could kind of see, oh, we're now walking down towards the river and we're walking past that stone. And now I'm walking up a little bit. There's that tree on the right. And all of the sentences had attached to places along the journey, meaning it was remembered. So as I was standing on that stage in Verona, I was I was actually visualizing having a walk around a Welsh country garden. Um, and that's the way that works for me with, with, with memory. I think you do just have to keep reading it over and over again as well. So, the, so that your muscle memory kicks in, you know, so, go on. That, that, so that method, this well-known method of like the, the Romans going through the house or the palace or whatever and, and attaching a moment to each room and everything, it probably doesn't work for everybody, right? For your clients. What, what are the other kind of methods that people can use to uh, keep, keep the progression through the speech? You can do it, um, you, you can do it through, through your body as well. It's another place. So like you can work around the parts of your body. I know some people who have done that. So the, the start of the speech might be that finger and then they work their way up. So again, it's the same principle. You're connecting parts of the speech and you're now right, I'm on the shoulder. That means it's this point and so on like that. Otherwise, a good old fashioned way to do it is just take one sheet of paper and kind of draw it out with lots of different colors, different size, you know, writing and stuff like that relating to the importance of the point you're making, like a mind map, but with a lot more colors and sometimes little pictures on it. And that can work as well, because then again, they're kind of visually then working around whatever it is that they've drawn. That can work quite nicely. Um, Does it... When you do the re- re- repeated practice, like a musician that you are, mm. uh, is it difficult to time it right to know that you've practiced it to the point of almost perfection or you've gone past that point? I'm thinking also in my head that I've seen, you know, Dave Gilmore from Pink Floyd saying that he always took the first recording of the solo, trying to replicate it on the third or fourth. It's never there. The same emotion. I think Slash from Guns N' Roses, I've heard him say the same as well. So is there any, you know, to say it the first time is going to have more emotion. You're you're not, that's not what you're saying to your clients at all. You're, you're, you're going, it must be practiced. Yeah. And I think sometimes, sometimes what you can do um, is, is, is like, and the Beatles used to do this actually when they, they were practicing is you can do it deliberately in a different way so you don't get so bored of it so you can like read it out to your teeth like that like i'm delighted to be here today and it's great to see you know da, 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 like that and just so it feels different or do it all in a very high pitch all just on one note so read the whole speech like that and then when you're on so restrict yourself in some kind of way so that then when you're on stage and you're free to vary, you know, your volume and your tone and all of that, you feel really excited and liberated and, you know, or do it very strictly like that. So um, that might work. I don't, I don't know whether you've seen the wonderful image of Lennon and McCartney when they're rehearsing two of us on the Let It Be album and they're singing through their teeth. Yeah, so it, I'm really looking forward to the Peter Jackson film that's coming out as well. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so speaking of the Beatles, um, <laughs> you, you are a huge fan. It's clear from your books because you're, you're referencing them, you know, deservedly because they are the masters, of course. Um, just going away from speech writing for a moment, on piano, which is your favourite Beatles track to play along to? Is it the simplicity of something like Hey Jude or is it something far more complex? It's actually, um, I think it's something um George Harrison yeah. something so not not even one of the Lennon and McCartney ones that one on the piano is 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 just beautiful and it was um my wife and and my wedding song as well we did an Argentine tango to to it and so it has a beautiful 
uh, beautiful memories for me. But that's, I love the chords in that. So that's a very simple C chord. And then with a descending, chromatic descending bass. In fact, so it's a chromatic descending bass on C first, and then he goes to relative minor, goes to A minor, and then it's chromatic descending bass from A minor as well. So it's wonderfully simple, but just so, um, so expressive. Pulling at the heartstrings like a good speech, the descending yeah. bass. Um, just a couple more questions. What advice, I, I was speaking to Mark Bowden and I asked him a very similar question. What advice would you give to people who have a, a real fear or even a phobia of public speaking? Positive visualization. I, I feel for you. I really feel for you. If, you, if you're someone who ha gets really bad nerves before public speaking, um, I did. I used to when I was in my 20s I used to get very very nervous before speaking and I don't mean giving speeches I mean just speaking at meetings you know while you were doing a tour de table and you were waiting for it to come to your turn to speak and I my heart would race and all of this and I think you can develop in your head a, a negative mantra that you just repeat i can't public i can't do speeches i can't do presentations i'm rubbish i get so nervous you say that to yourself over and over again and then and then you really can't because you keep telling yourself that same thing over and over again so change the story you tell yourself you know tell yourself you're brilliant tell yourself you can do this visualize yourself doing it see you just to imagine create a fantasy in your mind you know we can all do that we can all fantasize about going on holiday or being with people you know that we're, we're not with we all have the capacity to fantasize to imagine and so fantasize about giving an amazing speech where they are laughing at your jokes and they're waiting on your every word you're hanging on your every word and they are loving it and visualize yourself as as that person and just call on that memory before you're going to sleep, you know, before you give your speech and, and change your own narrative, because you can do this. There's heaps of people who, who get nervous, who have got nervous, and then they've turned around the way they thought about it. And they have then become very positive, confident speakers on the back of that. And practice, because there's so many times in, in corporate and in business where people spend so long making the PowerPoint and then they were standing up on stage and that's the first time they ever heard the words come out of their mouth. Yeah, Incredible. and they're all cotton wool tongues, yeah. Yeah, okay. Last question, because uh, Winning Minds and your Speak Like a Leader TED Talk is actually highly condensed version of the book, right? And you have these the the six things that everyone it's it's a it's a, a template for giving a a quick speech right and I've seen you do it on a, a party trick is underselling it but it's a nice thing that you do where you can take any topic and you do the the magic of three you do the breathless sentences all this kind of stuff um, so can you just super quickly explain that uh, that playbook and then I'll give you a question to finish which I gave Mark Bowden as well. And uh, let's see what you do with that. So your okay. system, the highly condensed version is? Th three breathless sentences, broken homes, failing schools, sink estates, create urgency. Sounds like you're hyperventilating. Three repetitive sentences. Is it right that half our children leave school with five less than five GCSEs? Is it right that people are waiting months for an operation? Is it right that people are scared to walk on the streets of our capital cities? Repetition creates emotion, builds energy with the audience. Then three opposites. We're bringing light, not darkness, giving people hope, not fear. Look into the future, not the past. Makes it sound as if you're balanced, not biased. Then you have a metaphor where you plant an idea in people's minds that you hope will take root and blossom. Then you don't want to get carried away with your metaphor. If you can taste sick in your mouth while you're saying it, you've gone too far. You need to save energy for step number five, which is exaggeration, because it's now or never. And I'm giving my heart and soul to this interview with you, Brennan. You know, I swear I could talk to you forever. It's, it's wonderful. Absolutely fantastic. And then end with a rhyme. 
because a rhyme is sublime and a rhyme works every time. And that's the six techniques. And so the question using this method, it's a bit harder than I've seen you had in the past, but the question is, would you rather, you have to fight between two options. So would you rather fight a horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? <laughs> have I got to answer that using my... my <laughs> if you can. Power? Right, okay. 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 Courage, determination, strength. I've never been one to shy away from a challenge. I've never been one to show fear in the face of a great adversary. I have never been one to take the easy option in life. I think there's something for all of us that we must look for the challenges in life, not the things which are easy. Showing our best and best better selves rather than our weak and timid selves and accepting great opportunities rather than turning them down. And for me, there would be no greater opportunity for me to stand taller as a human being than to engage in the ultimate combat of our times. Now here you have suggested to me the mightiest combat that makes David and Goliath look like something for children. And I would not want to fight lots of little things whatsoever. For me, the only solution that I could come up with is to fight the horse-sized duck. And if you don't approve, I don't give a f Oh, uh, you had to end with the gag, of course. <laughs> well done. That's a lot more difficult question than I've seen you do it with before. So that's really, really good. Thank you so much. And yeah, people, if you want to learn how to do this kind of stuff, then check out Simon on YouTube, on TikTok. Check out his three books. I'll put links to them in the description. It's been an absolute pleasure, Simon. Fantastic talk talking to you. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it, Bren, and that is the most surreal question I have ever been asked in an interview before. Thank you so much. 